Welcome to this talk. It's the first talk after lunch. I, I'm sure you appreciate the difficulty. It's, uh, it's easier for me because I'm, I'm getting like really entertained here by myself. I love laughing my own jokes. This is awesome. But for you, it's not going to be it's not going to be easy because you sit there and it's like, you know what? I'm after lunch. I, I could take a nap if I wanted. Right. So uh, anyhow, if you have any remarks or anything, um, I don't have a Q&A kind of thing. If probably we're not going to end, uh, kind of, we're, there's not going to not going to be a dedicated time for Q&A. So feel free to just raise your hand, shout, yell. I'm going to ask you questions, so be prepared. You know, whoever is going to not be able to answer, there's going to be a penalty. <laughs> I got to think what, but you know, there's going to be a penalty, unspecified. I have here like I have some pens here. If you have a question that I need to remember, I'm going to write it down. There's no paper, but. <laughs> Anywho, so I'm here to talk about three cool things about D. And I'm going to open with a true story from the 70s. And it's about the Red Telephone Company. Um, I hope even the younger of you recognize this as a telephone. It was a device that people used to communicate using wires. And you know, it, it, you see that round thing in the middle? That you dial numbers by, you create sparks. You, this was it, you, it's like And you know, the number of sparks there is gonna be the number. And uh, I remember there's this comedian who said like, if a guy has like three zeros in their number, I'm never, Forget that guy. I'm not going to call that guy. You know, I hate that guy, right? <clears throat> so the Red Telephone Company, the year was 1972, and uh, the company was in Australia, and they had a problem. Uh, there was stiff competition, and they couldn't differentiate themselves uh, to make a good profit. So uh, they had a meeting, and they said, what are we going to do to improve our revenue? And there's competition, and there's one requirement that was very bothersome for telephone companies in Australia, which was all costs must be flat. So the price of a, of a telephone conversation was dictated by the government to be constant regardless of the duration. But of course, telephone companies must pay proportional to the duration because there's cost involved in switching and um, you know, keeping the line occupied and everything. So that was a problem. It was a problem that there's a flat fee, and however, the company was losing on the long calls. So they made the following decision. Well, what do you think would be a good business decision at that point? When you have this cost structure and you want to reduce the number of minutes people spend speaking, to disconnect the call every once in a while. <laughs> That's awesome. I love the Polish business thinking here. <laughs> It was like pretty interesting. <laughs> well, in Romania, it would be bribe someone to do something. <laughs> so not to say we're, you know, so. <laughs> By the way, you know, the prime minister resigned in Romania like a day ago. This is amazing, like on corruption things. So I'm very happy and I'm radiating here. So anywho, uh, well, they didn't do that, neither of those. Um, they wanted to compete um, honestly, and they wanted to have good service. So what they did was they increased the weight of the handset. <laughs> True story. I'm not kidding. They made the handset heavier. And to this day, there's like relics in museums that have like it's lead inside. It's really heavy. So you pick that thing up and you spring it after five minutes, like, you know what? I don't want to talk anymore. <laughs> I'm kind of done here. So let's talk some other time, right? So what does this have to do with D? It does. I mean, it does have to do a lot with this talk because this talk, I'm going to talk about three things that are quite like that. Unexpected outcome from uh, sort of Interesting, this, so you, you make a decision in one direction, make the thing heavier, but the outcome is completely interesting and unexpected in a way, okay? So it's, it's this, this actually is part of a book called Lateral Thinking. 
So, and the, the premise of the book is that you gotta think sort of outside the box if you wish. You gotta think laterally about problems sometimes to solve them at best, right? Because there's no direct approach to the problem, uh, but there's a very good lateral approach to the problem. Uh, but first, I need to sort of discuss a few introductory facts about D. Um, it goes by a few design principles that um, I, I like very much personally, and I think they're very good for, for uh, today's uh, landscape of programming languages. Um, one interesting uh, aspect of D is that it must leave no room below. There should be no uh, thinking that, well, this portion of code I need to make really efficient, so I'm going to write it in C instead of D. So everything I can, you can do in C, you can do just as well in D, and it's going to be just as fast. So D shares the memory model of C, and actually can call C functions without, uh, without any translation overhead. Uh, but essentially, there's no, you don't want to, unless you have a large C code base, you just can write your own D code that's as fast as C. Um, however, it adds structure on top of that largely unstructured C uh, memory model. Uh, by adding like typing constraints on on uh, on these um, on this universe that is uh, the the C memory layout. So <clears throat> another thing about D that I like is that it's multi paradigm. It's a it's a well balanced language um, over different paradigms and different ways of of using of using it and of doing things. Um, I what one category of languages I don't like are languages that are that forgot leg day. You know what the leg day is? Like if, if you Google, like you can on your phone, like literally right now, you can go like friends don't let friends skip leg day. And it has to do with working out. Because many guys are, you know, I, I, I want to have like a big bicep, I want to make my, can be strong, right? So they exercise only the upper from here on. They forget the leg, they don't do the leg day, they skip. They kind of sit down, they don't do nothing, right? And then you have these people, like if you Google for that and you look at images, there are going to be a variety of guys with very good upper body, but uh, like very skinny legs. And there are a number of languages. I'm not going to name any. I'm not going to say Rust or any, I'm not going to say it. <laughs> that skip leg day. They do only one thing or one category of things, and they don't do them all. They, they grow disharmoniously. Okay? I could mention more, <laughs> but you know, this is a peaceful environment and <laughs> I want to leave Poland in peace and you know, go back home. So, this is one, like, one thing that I think is very important in designing a programming language and it's very difficult as well because it's very hard to not insist too much on something to an extent that's disproportionate to the size of the problem. Okay? Uh, two other things about D that I like are that it's at the same time principled and practical. It's a practical language. It's, it's supposed to be used casually by people, even those who are not uh, programmers uh, first thing. They, they might be, have other uh, duties such as uh, science or math, and uh, they, want to, they need to use the programming language to, to get to their, uh, what they want to do. Uh, but it's also principled because you got you to gotta have like solid principles at the basis of a, a programming language of today so you can, uh, so you can guarantee things and you can, you, can, you can guard your own abstractions as a language. And I think these are important things. And one thing that uh, sort of uh, comes uh, from the C++ experience was we want to avoid arcana. We don't, we don't want to have many... Uh, dirty corners in the language and, and things like that. So we want to avoid that. Um, you know, these are subjective. So you, one can claim we, uh, we attain some of these to some extent. Um, and it segues into the question, why do, does anyone want to learn more about D? And why does one want to use it? Because it's at this point, it's not a mainstream language yet. And uh, well, there's a party line which you can find on the homepage dlang.org, which is D is a has a language having going for it convenience, modeling power, and, perf and efficiency performance. And I coined those, I invented those three things. There's, there had to be a party line. 
Because if there's no party line, there's no party. <laughs> right? I mean, you had to have something. And I think the, this, these are a good summary of what D does well. Uh, but at the same time, of course, it's not the whole story. And uh, then I talked to people using D, and uh, I, I heard different reasons. Uh, one is that it's very fast to compile. And it's not only it's very fast, because there are some languages, like interpreters, that are really fast to get, get, uh, get running. But it compiles fast and produces fast code. So there's a combination, combination of like real quick compilation time and good generated code, which is uncommon. It's very uncommon, actually. And this is, a, this is in stark contrast with what we learned, uh, we, what we instinctively got used to in the C++ milieu, which is in C++, you, the compilation takes a long time. Who has trouble, who would like their compiler to be five times faster in C++? Yes, all hands, please. OK, all. Everybody wants their C++ compiler to be five times faster. And nobody does, because it's impossible. Right? So it's a huge problem. And we got, we got to a point when we brainwashed ourselves to the extent that, well, it's slow, but it produces fast, fast code. So there's this association that we implicitly made in our minds that fast code can only be achieved through slow compilation, because it's got to do hard work to figure out what's the fastest code there. And you know, it's kind of difficult. And, you know. and actually, this kind of got self-reinforced by languages that are really quick to compile, like you know, produce bytecode, PHP, Ruby. right? And then they, they run real slow. You know my favorite joke about Ruby? Who uses Ruby? A couple of you. You're going to hate this. Um, <laughs> Ruby is 50 times slower than any other language, including Ruby. <laughs> so, it's like. What, any, any performance measure I read about Ruby, it was like, oh, it was 50 times slower. And, you know, so that's it's kind of a, an axiom there somewhere. So we got used to this notion. It's either compile, it takes very long time to compile, and then it's, um, it's fast, or it takes very short time to compile, and then it's crappy. Okay? And then you have, like, both. It's essentially like C++ quality code and Go speed compilation. Which is awesome. And this it can be life changing. This can be like, this can, it influences the things you want to do. Because if you want to experiment something, you can do it in five seconds, not five minutes or five hours, right? I've, there's been projects that take five hours to compile. And actually, the, one of the challenges at large corporations, I'm not going to say which corporation in Seattle, Washington, very large corporation produce an operating system, but of course that's completely anonymous. Nobody can <laughs> guess what I'm saying here. One challenge is making the build run less than 24 hours. <laughs> because if you cross the 24, you can't, you can't have a build overnight. You can't, you can't you know, it, the day is an important granularity, <laughs> right? So you don't want the cycle to be longer than 24 hours. So anywho. Where was I? So <clears throat> I noticed that people say, you know, with D, I get an interpreter style experience with compile time, uh, compile uh, speed, uh, with uh, interpreter style with compile quali quality code, which is awesome. People love that. And again, it can be life changing because it changes the way you do things every day. Another thing that um, I notice people like is easier to get into than alternatives. Uh, people have started working on D projects simply because it was, we have this Java team or this Python team, and they want to, it's just, you know, we, they have a prototype, it's too slow. We gotta make it faster. And we have the alternative, you know, spending the rest of their careers uh, teaching them C++, and then they teach them to them, their sons and daughters, and then they continue the tradition that way. <laughs> or we could have them like start in D like right now and get something done. So that was another uh, factor, and you know, another is fun. Uh, one common thing that people tell me, you know, essentially I'm listening to the choir here, but you know, let, let, take it with a grain of salt. But people who got into into the D language and like it are, it's very hard for me to return to other languages now. It makes it difficult because I got used to these nice things, 
right? It's like you live in a larger house or, you know, you have a better car or whatever, and it's hard to kind of go back to, like, your Trabant, right? You don't... Does your, you, you know, right? You know that Trabant car, right? At least the older ones. It's still around? Ukraine makes it, right? So anyhow, um, I don't want to mention, like, the D language and Trabant in the same sentence. It doesn't, doesn't bode well. So there are reasons for which you don't want to use D. And of course, there's no party line, hence the empty bullet. But uh, there are people who tell me, you know, I'm not using D because, and some reasons are, uh, formal specific specification is weak. Like in C++, you have a standard, and it's very well done, and it's, it's carefully written. And you, you have some, some baseline that allows you to say, my code is correct, or the compiler has a bug, or what, what do I need to do to write correct code, and stuff like that. Uh, there's not enough, actually this has changed a bit recently, so we do have a, a good corporate sponsor in Germany, uh, Sociomantic, uh, but, you know, we do need uh, D as, a, as a, an environment, needs more corporate support to become mainstream. Uh, consequently, there are not many libraries that are out there. Uh, we have folks who contribute some library and they maintain it for a while and then they move on, they, they go away, and that's, uh, that's an unpleasant phenomenon. And it's a large language, it's not a small language. Um, I noticed, for example, the Golan language has a great initial experience going for it, which is you go and essentially can produce code in an hour. You can write Go code, you can write a, you know, a meaningful D, a Go code in, in a short time. And that's a good thing. However, um, you know, some folks, and again, the, the crowd is self-selected, but some folks tell me, you know, you know now that I know Go, I, I want to move on. I want to forget it and move on. Because learning the language is not the major part, the bulk part of your work. The bulk part of your work is using the language, and that's what you're going to spend. You know, you don't want a language that you learn quickly because you don't learn a new language every day, right? And so on. Am I trash talking other languages too much? Like... Rust, Go, C++, all of those are terrible languages. Okay, <clears throat> so D is a large language. And it, in a way, it's uh, probably so, because you know, deep down, I think that the, the problem space is large. And if you have a large language, you're going to address a large problem space. And if you artificially limit that problem space, you're taking you're taking the, the problem from the language and you're putting it on the shoulders of the programmers using the language. So that's not good either. All right. <clears throat> so, ah, I owe you this. Hello, world. But I'm going to take it and transfer it into something else that's going to illustrate one of those lateral thinking things. So, well, you have the, ha you, know, you, know, you know the shebang? Who knows about the shebang? Shebang in Linux, or in Unix, right? So there's this thing, you can actually make this executable and just run it and it works. And uh, pff, nothing special here, it's like uh, really boring. Import this guy, std std io, void main, write line something. I'm ready to go, are you bored? I, I'm getting there. So um, uh, why is this, why is this std std? Why do I need to import something for everything? Why does no code at top level? And there are explanations for each. But um, and actually, this is interesting. Why no code at top level, like at the left side of the screen at global level? Why, why don't you want to have ex executable code there? Can anyone like shout an answer? Why don't you want to have code at top level in the large program? Entry point. Entry, so the entry point notion becomes odd, unclear, right? And actually, even good style Python programs, good style Perl programs, good style Ruby programs, they do have a function that they, is the initial entry point in a program. And so um, D is aimed for large programs, not small scripts. So that's why you need to have the main function everywhere. OK. <clears throat> and uh, three nice things is that they're simple. They're, it, you know, uh, this program is simple, it's correct, and it's scriptable. So scripto we discussed a bit already. Uh, there'll be something interesting to say about the correctness of this code. So, you know, like the C hello world that we know since like, what, 40 years ago? 
Well, it's wrong. It's an incorrect program. I'm not kidding. Why is it wrong? It is an incorrect program. Yes. Probably namespace should be able to write void. Namespace, void. No, so the, C, the, the, the C program written like int main and include this, you know, written the right way. Return. What about return? Well, what? The main function needs to return the The main function needs to return zero on success, non-zero on failure. This is the this is the C standard. This is what C does. And what does main return in the C hello world that just has one line printf? It returns the number 13, friends. You know why? Because there are 13 characters in hello world backslash n. Print, that, here's why. Printf returns the number of characters written. And hello world with comma and everything is 13 characters. So it's going to return 13 into the EAX register on Intel machines. And the EAX register is where programs deposit their functions, re deposit their return value. So the operating system picks that and looks like an EAX and says, hello, 13, how are you doing? And it returns that to the console, to the top level. And that means all Hello World programs in C ever run signal that they failed. <laughs> so that's not correct, my friends. Yeah, I, don't, I wouldn't agree that that's a correct thing to do. How can you tell that they don't fail? How can you tell that they don't fail? Exactly. So printf is going to return minus 1. In, uh, if there's an error, which is going to be converted magically by the operating system into the number 255, because that's how things work. 250, it's a, you know, a byte with all ones, and it's gonna, it's gonna, if you echo dollars question mark there, you're gonna get see 255, interesting. So it's either 13 or 255, nothing else. It's one of these. How about the C process hello world? What does it do? Does it, is it correct? It's, correct. it's not correct. Why is it not correct? I see, I see how offended at least one person right here. The C++, it always reports success. It always returns zero, because that's what the C++ rule has. If you don't return from main, it returns zero automatically. So actually, the C++ program, there's progress because it's optimistic. It always returns success, no matter if it fails or not, which is awesome. And it doesn't throw exception because Exceptions are set to false by default in I streams, and it returns zero no matter what. And it could happen that hello world fails because you write to a, a, the wrong handle there and, and stuff and redirect to the wrong handle and, and such. So, you know, these things are important. And uh, it's a bummer that they don't happen. Here it does happen. It, uh, if, uh, if anything happens, write line throws an exception, and uh, the program is going to print an error message to the standard uh, error uh, uh, console and it's going to return uh, non-zero code and et cetera. So <clears throat> this is for fun. I would say it's important to have the right thing there, but it's not characteristic of large programs written in the language. So it's, uh, it's just for, for laughs, OK? Now, uh, I've done something here. I've already kind of uh, moved on to the next slide. Uh, you, see the, you see the difference here? What what I do? Yeah, so I move like the import. So forget the you know I'm not going to discuss much this uh, shebang line. The first line there for scripting that's fine. Don't worry about it. But I move the import inside main. And uh, the question is, should that be even possible? And if possible, should that be even meaningful? Because possible and meaningful are very different things such as in C++, if you put a pound include inside a function, it's possible. <laughs> and you know what? It could compile and run. It may not do what you want it to do, and it may be a career-limiting move for whoever writes, writes that. So don't do it, OK? And in Python, there's a debate of whether it's good or not to do. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a problem, it's, it's a question, it's an open question, like 
Should you allow local imports or not? And are they any good? Python does allow them, but it's weird what it does. So I, you know, I, one day I was sitting there and I thought, what if I take the import? And you know, it, it all started from the turtles principle. There's this uh, joke about the turtles all the way down. Do you know it? Turtles all the way down. Yeah, I'm seeing only one knot, so I'm gonna actually tell the joke. So you know, pl please laugh at the end, or at least like do something that's gonna convey to me that you're still awake. Okay, so there's this uh, physicist, like a great scientist, who's giving this talk at a conference about the universe and matter and stars and everything. And then the old, an old lady comes to him and says, you're wrong, young man. It's all, it's the whole earth lies on a turtle on the back of a turtle. And he said, oh, okay, you're not gonna catch me there because what does, the, what, what does a turtle sit on? Oh, it's a different turtle. It's another turtle, bigger one. Uh, how about the other turtle? Oh, it's, it's a different turtle. And he says, what about the other turtle? And the old lady says, young man, you're not gonna fool me. It's turtles all the way down. <laughs> and that's how it works. And you'd be amazed that actually in Indian mythology, mythology, there's a similar story with, I think it's, there's an elephant there. It's not a turtle. They didn't have turtles in it, right? So they went with what they had, right? Local economy, <laughs> elephants. So, and Shiva, kind of, there's a story about it, which is very interesting. Anywho, so, uh, God, I'm supposed to talk about DNI, like, not Shiva. Okay, so, turtles. And a very good principle in D is that this turtles all the way down, which means you can put anything anywhere. I want to declare a class, I should be able to put in another class or a function or wherever the hell I want. I want to declare a function, I should be able to put in another function. I want to declare a template, some difficult thing, and I should be able to put it anywhere else. Template inside template, inside function and everything. So it follows, I thought one day, that I should be able to take an import from the top level and put it inside the scope. And that should just work, sort of automatically. And I put that in there and tried to compile, it didn't work. You can't do that, the compiler said. And I called Walter, the author of the language and the, the main author of the compiler, and I said, Walter, can you tell me why I can't put an import inside a function? And he said, well, let me look at the code. He said, well, in the type checker, the first line here says, if, it, if you're not at top level, issue an error. And I said, why don't you come on that out and see what happens? I'm not kidding, so he commented out and it worked. <laughs> and it worked interestingly, that meaningfully, that's my point, because it allows you to localize whatever symbols you're importing to the function that you're importing them into. So, you know, it's, it's more modular that way, which makes it not only meaningful, but interesting, yes. How is it different from Python? I'm not sure, I think Python has some interaction between the dynamic and the static scoping that this is adverse to. So you can't do this in Python, it's just more tricky to get it done. I'm not, I'm not sure of the details, but I, I know there's a raging debate in the Python community about this. Okay, so, well, interesting. But this is like, this is interesting, but it's not like really like tele, red telephone story interesting. I'm gonna get there. All right, so uh, there's one more thing about this that I wanted to. You can define a type inside a function in D, and you can return from the function a value of that type, which is weird because you can't name that type. It doesn't have a name because outside the function, there's, there's no name space for it. So you define inside the function, you define like a struct or a class, and you write it and you say, return an object of this type. And outside the function, the caller can't tell the name of the type. So th that's why they call it a Voldemort type, because it can't be named, <laughs> right? It doesn't. <laughs> so a number, and this is an idiom which is useful and meaningful in D, just because of the Thurow's principle. Why don't you take the old lady to the max, okay? Like, do whatever you can, do it anywhere you can. And that was, there were interesting consequences to this. But let me kind of get the, 
get, get it even, even more uh, interesting here. Uh, let me write a template function. And indeed, you don't have the, you know, the angle brackets for templates. You just have, like, for a function, you have two sets of parentheses. One is the types, and the second is the values. So log is going to take any type t, and is going to take a value of any type t. And there's deduction everything. For example, like log hello is going to infer that the type of uh, t is actually string. Nice. OK. Now inside log, which is a generic function, uh, we import uh, some stuff, uh, daytime and stdio, because we want to write the current time, and we want to write uh, to the console. So we need these primitives. And inside main, we say log hello. OK, nice. Now, the interesting, the, the red telephone interesting part is what if I comment log out? So I, I never use it. And my question to you is, should those imports be affected at all? No, because it's like a, the tree in the forest, log is never used, it shouldn't be even compiled, and therefore its imports need never be processed. Right? So if I come and log out and I build a program, there's going to be no import. The, the files are not going to be opened for those particular modules and whatever. And the files imported by them transitively are not going to be open ever. So the, the program is going to compile a lot faster because of that. There's no need to import more things, type check and all that stuff. There's going to be just, you know what, I have a function here. I'm, I'm lexing it. I'm parsing it to the extent that it's balanced, uh, balanced curly braces, and I'm done. And this is, like, this is like not interesting for five lines, but it's interesting for whole libraries of templates. Because this means you can have large libraries of templates at zero cost. You pay as you go. Whatever instantiate is going to get compiled, it's going to get used, it's going to take time to build. Whatever is not is going to be compiled to Baron's parentheses, which is really fast, it's zero cost essentially, and you're done. So you can now build large libraries of templates guide, guided by this principle, you put all imports local. And that's, that's getting there, that's getting to like really interesting stuff. So we start with a very simple principle, we want to have these turtles. And we got to the point where actually we have faster compiles. And it's even more so. Can I have a question? So, sure. Uh, well, I do see a problem with it. For example, let us somebody get a large file where you have lots, lots of functions but rely on some other libraries. And let's say like for some time you are not using one function from that file. And some at some point in time you start using that function, but you're missing a file because you've forgotten about the dependency of that function. If you have the imports global, then you automatically see uh, see the dependencies and you can prevent uh, prevent yourself for uh, for that, uh, for that problem. Right. When you have the dependencies local and <coughs> hidden, uh, then it's more background. Yeah? Right. So l let me summarize what uh, what the question was. Uh, in essence, it was you're doing lazy compilation, and that has its own disadvantages. And that's totally fine. So it has its own disadvantages. And the one mentioned was essentially it depends on what code you write. The dependency structure is going to depend on, for example, if you comment log out or not, right? So if you have it in or not. It has its own challenges. But on, on the whole, it's better to have both options instead of just one. So this is not a universally great technique, but it's a good technique to have, uh, to, to have as an option. So um, the weirder thing that we discovered about this after starting to use, so by the way, this is like very, very addict. I, I, I'm just bragging here because I wanted to show you how easy it is to write a very addict function that works. Um, you can pass like dot, dot, dot after t, and that means any number of arguments uh, starting from zero and you can get to write that stuff, and it's just working. So veridics are really easy to do in C++. Much, so, much, uh, so much easier than in, in, uh, in D, so much more than in C++. So that's fine. Now, 
Natural lexical scoping leads to faster builds. This is an unexpected, this, I hope I convinced you that this is like red telephone style conclusion. Because it doesn't, it's not, it's not immediate. And it's not obvious until you go through it, right? Um, I actually should add something else. Let me see if I have a slide for it. Yeah, no, not yet. So there's something else that's even less obvious but also has an impact on build times, which is if you have these large template libraries, there's less time spent linking because you only compile the functions you use and you only link the functions you use. And the way a linker works is it's going to go through your symbols and at the end it's, it has unresolved symbols. It's going to look for those symbols in libraries and that's a search, it's slow. That's the slow part of the linker is looking for, through all libraries available in the, in the system. So with this approach, you get, the compiler is going to do more work, but the compiler can have control over and you can make it fast. But the linker is like, you know, whenever you're done compiling, you give it to the linker and the linker can take like a very long time to link things. And it turns out that this uh, natural scoping puts less pressure on the linker, which is again a very interesting uh, and unexpected conclusion. All right, so we have this. The second story has to do with purity. So, well, you know, like functional purity, who can define it for us? Someone else, you, you spoke once. I know you know. Someone else, yes, please. Right uh, the same results with uh, the same uh, inputs. Same arguments lead to the same results. Yes, we agree? No, okay. Purity is uh, the function doesn't have side effects. But that's another way of saying the same, yeah. right? Does it have states? State, yeah, there's no shared state among calls of the same function, right? So that kind of, the, essentially it's like in math. In math, the sine function, whenever you pass this number to it, it's gonna produce the same number, it's not gonna do anything else. And this is like an important concept in programming, purity. Pure functions are a great thing. They make systems really easy to think about because all you care about is the inputs and the outputs. If the outputs are wrong, then you know the function is wrong, et cetera, et cetera, or the input was wrong. Um, at the opposite end of the spectrum would be programmed with many, much state and many global variables. And you have functions communicated through global, global variance, uh, variables and non-local dependencies and a lot of bad things, right? So I hope it, I don't need to, we don't need to talk much about this to get convinced, all of us, that functional purity is a good thing. Um, the trouble with purity is that writing the entire programs in, uh, functional puri uh, with functional purity is difficult. Uh, you gotta do monads. And it, so th there's a number of techniques that are dedicated to making purity easier to digest. So there's entire language features and library features dedicated to addressing purity programming properly because IO is very difficult in purity, with purity, right? So, my thesis is, however, that in a large program, it's good to have at least portions of it that are pure combined with portions that, for example, do I.O. and are not that pure, right? Dirty. So, nice. Let's see. Well, <clears throat> um, what was this? Factorial, right? Everybody, I mean, I'm sure in first month of college programming course, whatever, they, you did this atrocity. But you're all guilty here, okay? What's wrong with this factorial? It's expensive. It's expensive. How much does it cost? <laughs> How many is slot, huh? A lot of time. A lot of, stack. a lot of stack. So what's wrong with factorial as written? It's <laughs> right, so you know. Well. 
Well, it, it's there, but it's in a cryptic format because I like, I like to kind of write things a bit weirdly. It's P space. It means it's polynomial space. It, it consumes space proportional to the input. And you know why? Because that fun yeah, essentially you need to have the stack with all cost of factorial before you get the result. So the stack is going to grow with the size of the input, n. It's going to be proportional to n, polynomial space. Sorry? If you reverse the order, that's not going to help. It's more deep than that. The problem with factorial not being um, constant space is that the multiplication follows the recursive call. So you need to do the recursive call and have the result on the stack and then do one more operation, which is the multiplication, and then return. The trouble is with that start there. The fact that you need the multiplication after the recursive call makes it non-tail recursive. OK? And I got to say that this is like, if you look for functional program examples, this is going to be the first that's going to come. Together with two others, what are the other examples of functional programs that are classic? Fibonacci. And the third? Loop. Loop. Oh, no, that's not the third. <laughs> well, the third, so we have Fibonacci, we have Factorial, and we have another algorithm that's a classic. Huh? Quick sort. Yeah, I swear to you, if you Google functional programming examples, you're going to get these three. They're not bubble sort. They don't do that. But actually, the, quick sort, the function of quick sort is worse than bubble sort. But let's do that fight another day. So these are all three are corrupt. They're bankrupt. They're computationally wrong. This guy is P space. It doesn't need to be. The Fibonacci, God, this is like the most awful example. Somebody should be in jail for this stuff. <laughs> they should put them in prison. What's the complexity of Fibonacci? It's Fibonacci. <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding. So it's worse than exponential. It's like the complexity of computing a Fibonacci number with the classic function example is Fibonacci. It grows like super exponentially with the size of the input. This is awful. And how about a quicksort that's quadratic? <laughs> so quicksort is not, is, first, uh, it, first, first of all, it, take, uh, it takes the first number of the pivot. So if your data is already always sorted, almost sorted or always sorted the other way, it's going to be quadratic. And a lot of input is structured a bit, right? And it's terrible. Not to mention it makes copies of the input and everything. So I love functional programming. And I love functional languages. I think it's a great principle to aspire to. But they did themselves the worst, the worst disaster by, by having examples that are com computationally bankrupt. This is the best you can, these are the best three examples that you can come up with for a wonderful paradigm. Well, let me add the see hello world then. It's going to be just as good. Anywho, so. Not good. How do we fix it? If you Google for advanced functional programming examples, you're going to find the better version, which is this guy. So, <clears throat> well, uh, in the advanced factorial function, we have a local function, which I'll call conveniently crutch. And inside that function, it takes two arguments. And it's going to, that this function is going to be tail recursive. Because you see, the recursion step here passes the multiplication inside the function as a, as a temporary, you know, as, as the uh, second parameter. And I'm passing this guy inside the function again. And that way I can essentially optimize this function to con consume constant space even though it's, uh, it's recursive. Uh, factor is going to be linear unless you use the, there's a synthetic formula I can use with uh, exponentials and stuff, but essentially like factorial, I'm talking about like the, the, the linear version. That, but I want it constant space at least. All right, so we use this guy and we call crutch with uh, seed, a one, and that's my linear function, you know, that's my factorial. All right, well, <clears throat> let me ask you this. 
Oh, which one do you like more? This guy or that guy? Depends on the criteria. I don't know. Um, looks good on the page. It doesn't have the word crutch in it, for example. <laughs> that would be a good criteria right there. So the first is more readable, and that's why you know it's it, it's an example in uh, in most uh, textbooks there. Huh? It's an obvious solution. Well, okay. So first of all, let me let me clarify. This is pure. Pure is good. So you can indeed actually attach pure to it, and it's going to compile and run, and that's nice. So it's a pure function because it doesn't use any state. Awesome. So well. <laughs> In discussing this, this whole thing about uh, what's obvious, what's not obvious, you know, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, if you look at this guy, which is sort of the right, this is the right way to do it, computationally speaking, this is, you don't want to do it any other way. You don't want to do it with linear space. And that extends to a number of other, uh, you know, uh, simple functions and more complicated functions and paradigms. So this is also the right thing. But the problem here is that you need, you know, this result here that you carry through as an intermediate value is really, it's a local variable. It's like I have a local here and I'm using it. You know, and this is also pure, which is awesome, look pure. So I have a pure function and it's, it's like this. However, if you open any math book, how is factorial defined? It's like that. It says it's, is it? It's defined like this. <clears throat> the factorial in the math book, the math book, not the Haskell book. <laughs> this is the, like the fourth language I'm destroying right now. Not the Haskell book, the math book. It, it's a big pie, not the, not the, Sweet. It's the, the letter pi in Greek. It's a big pi from 1 to n of i. It's an iteration. No math book is going to say, oh, uh, let's define a lemma called crutch and start from there and see what happens. <laughs> and even math is not going to define a recursive. It's not going to say, maybe rarely, but not most of the time, no. It's going to say it's a product of numbers from 1 to n. And it's a pi. It's even a, there's a symbol for it. It's so frequent that there's a symbol for it, like some product, pi. So in math, it's actually defined like this. Sorry. It's defined like an iteration. And I'm having a, you know, this is like a dirty word to do because I'm having a temporary result here, and I'm bashing result with the multiplication result and the current number, and it's kind of a dirty function, and it's not pure, right? So, <clears throat> yes? From the Kali side, but from the Kali side, there is no difference. Wise words, my friend. From the, from the col color side, that function looks completely fine, pure. Inside, it does some dirty things. Right? So in, inside, the things are happening that are mutation. But out from the outside, it's just as good as any pure function. It's going to run a lot faster, too. So what's there not to like? And you know, this actually is a great segue into the next slide. You know this movie, pure Pulp Fiction? So I saw like a short story about this, this one slide. So I gave this, I, I showed this slide in three cities in, in Australia. Melbourne, Sydney, and um, um, Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane. So I, I showed this slide, and in Melbourne, like, they, they, had a, they laughed their ass off, okay? And in the other two cities, they didn't. <laughs> and, you know, then I talked to the organizers, and he's, he's, he said, oh, actually, Melbourne, uh, that was the, the place where, yeah, that's where, he said it's the most Americanized city in Australia. So Pulp Fiction was very popular there, but not in the other two cities for some reason. So people are like, okay, what's, who's this black guy with a wig? I don't know. So is, is Pulp Fiction popular in Poland? Do you know? 
Yes, thank you very much. All right. So this slide hit the spot to use an another code from the same movie. All right, so what does a pure function look like? The question is, well, my argument would be a pure function must be pure at the interface level for the caller. So pure function must return this. We agreed on this. You're with me now in this, okay? We are com accomplices. So as you leave this room, you're guilty already for agreeing with me, okay? We agreed like, you know, 15 slides ago. <clears throat> pure functions always send the same result for us. I swear, there's a guy who said it. I have proof. It's on video, okay? You admitted it. So that means no reading and writing of globals. You can have a global constant because it never changes. That's totally fine. As long as it's global, it's not fine anymore. You're not calling other impure functions. But how about like, if I have like a local transient state inside the function, that should be totally fine because the caller can't tell. And there's no other way I can compute that inside transitory function but from the argument to the function because I just said we're not using globals, right? So there's no way to produce anything from what I have except from the local, from the, uh, from the arguments. There's no other way. Yes? You just need to have exclude caching of larger. Caching? Yes. Memoization? Yes. Whoa, whoa. What about it? <laughs> <laughs> for the caching, we need to have a state that is shared between the calls. Right. For memoiza memoization is a trick that you can use to simulate purity without actually doing it. But should be also considered a pure function, even if- I agree, I agree. Memoization is within purity, yes. Uh, and actually a loop with local state is just as well a pure endeavor. I and mean, let me put it this way. If you're a proud, if you're a proud, honest, tax-paying citizen of Poland, <laughs> okay, or any country in the world, does it matter that you have some dirty thoughts inside that nobody knows about? <laughs> They're in your behind closed doors. And it's all consensual. It's all like, it's fine. It's totally legal to have those thoughts that may not be pure. Right? As long as your interface, as long as you open the door to your house and go out, you pay your taxes, okay? You're a legal, law-abiding citizen, and you do the right things, and you help little old ladies cross the street, even if they don't want to, and <laughs> that kind of stuff, right? So purity is an interface matter. It's not an implementation matter. And this is deep. This is not, the, I try to explain this to functional programs, and they get blocked. When they see that, they see that loop, they say, you know, I, I, you, bet you, you can take me in the back, shoot me, because I'm not going to live with this. Okay? They, they're like, they get blocked at this. But then it's like, well, let me explain. It's local state, and it's computer from the arguments. There's no way you can do anything else but pure. Right? So this is sort of un, unusual. And the, the, the interesting thing, we introduced this in D. We said you can't have a pure function. You can declare local variables inside a pure functional problem. And what happened next? People said, actually, a lot of my code was already pure. Right? A lot of my uh, you know, interfaces were pure already. It's just that I couldn't care to write shit like this. <laughs> I, you know, they, don't, they don't like it. It was by choice they didn't want to write it that way. But purity would impose them to write that way. But they're very happy to write it this way and slap a pure on top of the function and have the compiler check it. So it was a very good way for programmers who are not used to pure functional style to get into it. The next thing that happened was relaxed pure. So the next thing that happened was <clears throat> we noticed that uh, a number of functions were still in inaccessible for purity. And we said, well, what if you have something like a reverse function? And the reverse function takes an array of any number of elements. This is the uh, syntax for an array in D. And what you need to do is swap elements from the end of the array all the way to the middle. Make sense? It's a trivial function. 
And the dollar is like the last, you know, it's a dot length really is the length of the array. And, uh, you know, this is like the classic reverse function. And the question would be here, is reverse uh, worthy of being pure, considered pure or not? What do you think? Depends on swap. Swap is in the same category. Let's, let, you can write it by hand. You say AI gets this guy, that guy, that gets that guy, et cetera. So it's a swap function. It's nothing particular about it. But I'm asking about reverse because you know it uses, it takes this array sort of by reference. It has a pointer to the array and it swaps element in, in, elements into the existing array and then it returns. So is it worthy of having a purity uh, attribute attached to it? Depends on your morals, right? <laughs> so it's a good, it's a non-trivial question because you can go either way and be right or wrong, as it were, right? You can, you can it's a, it's an ambiguous because actually you are you are changing on your parameter, but you're changing it transitively, like through a pointer. It's indirect, so you're reaching through the parameter and getting to pointers and array elements and stuff like that. And the question is, is if that could be considered pure. And initially it wasn't. Initially it was if it's an array or if it has indirections, you're off limits. That's not pure. So then we noticed that a lot of people were asking for this kind of stuff because they said, I want this semi-purity. I'm changing arguments transitively through pointers. I want the semi-purity to implement real pure functions. Like it's a good part, it's a good building block for a real pure function. So then we, uh, you know, we studied the problem for a bit and there's one gentleman, Don Clarkson, who works at uh, Sociomantic in, uh, in Berlin. And he said, you know what? We can make this work. And we put it in the compiler and weak purity is a thing now. And it helps reusing code among pure and impure functions. And you can provably have pure functions that still change their arguments in indirect ways. So that was another very interesting source of progress. <clears throat> so what we have here is either we have something like a factorial, and it takes a simple type, no indirections, it's an integer, and it's very easy to check that it's pure, even though it uses, oh, sorry. Uh, where was I? Yeah. So you can, you can easily prove that this is pure. And then you can, uh, I hate being like away from. And then you have this, and you have this thing and you say it's also pure. And because of this stuff, you can do things like this, which is where I wanted to get. There's a difference between factorial before and factorial after, which is, you see that big int thing. It's a library type, it's not a built-in type. It's an arbitrary large integer. You know, you can like essentially it uses dynamic allocation and pointers and stuff inside to allocate as many digits as possible. And it operates on unbounded number of of, uh, of uh, digits, right? So at this point, factorial knows how to compute a factorial of even really large numbers of uh, integers. So without with you long, you can compute up up until like I think 700 or maybe less on 64 bit. It, you can't fit a lot of factorials in there, right? But with this guy, you can compute factor of 1,000 and you're fine. It's gonna take a while, and it's gonna take a while to print. You have a lot of, this, of uh, digits there. But it works. <clears throat> and sometimes you actually do need it. So the, this works only because of weak purity that I just talked about in reverse. Otherwise, it won't work because you have pointers there and you have indirection and you have uh, indirect changes and stuff like that. So this is remarkable. Great. Well, aftermath. So you can have parameters with mutable state reachable, then you call it relaxed pure. If you don't have mutable state reachable from your parameters, then it's Haskell style observed purity. You can still have state inside that's mutable. That's totally fine. And you can, that way you can effectively implement pure functions in imperative style. And I think that's a big thing. I think this is important. Third story. All right, so how are we on time? We start at 1.30? All right, okay, great. 
Third story, <coughs> the generative connection. Um, who can define, uh, let me kind of go back one slide so I say, so okay. Who can define what generative programming is? Generative programming. Not generic, generative. Programs that generate programs. Code that generates code, exactly. So you have code that, you know, what's a simple example of generating program? Compiler. Yes, compiler, yeah, that would be a good example. Transpiler things. Lambdas. Uh, let me think about it. God damn. Uh, doesn't seem that way. Uh, if you, you could use Lambdas in a compiler and then you have it. <laughs> I'm not sure if Lambdas proper, the, you, you write function and you call them immediately, but that's not generating code essentially. Templates. A very good example for generative programming. So actually there's a number of examples that actually generate code by means of templates in C++. Uh, what are they? There's more mundane examples. Simpler. Huh? Self, yeah, those self-printing programs, awesome. <clears throat> Interface compiler, so you have IDL and you know, that kind of stuff and you, you pass it through a compiler and you generate some, some other code in a host language. Uh, there's a more trivial example that I have. Uh, let me, I forgot it while I was speaking. Uh, macros? Uh, macros is a good example, but uh, oh yeah, Lex and Yak. Boom. You, you know Lex and Yak? or Bison, whatever, you know, whatever the mode is today, but Lexenac were the first. And you pass the Lexenac programs through a code generator that would generate C code, and then you would use that to build an actual compiler. So that was a gener code generating engine. What about transformations? What about transformations? Like XSLT. Transformations like XSLT. Um, I think you could qualify those as generative, yes. So I, I think it's a, there's a good case to say these uh, these things generate new code from existing code by recipes, so that makes uh, that makes sense. All right, so <clears throat> it's uh, it turns out that this generative programming, if you search for it, it's uh, kind of growing in there's in, there's growing interest in it uh, for by folks, and um, it's interesting because there's a generic connection because something, sometimes you have generic programming inter, interacting with gen, gener, generative programming, uh, which makes it a bit confusing, but it just so happens that this is the case. Sometimes generic code needs generative uh, approaches and vice versa. So how about the syntax for generative uh, programming? For example, you want to embed um, regular expressions into your language, right? Who knows about like um, Eric Niebler's regular expression package for C++? There's one in the back, I, I knew it. There's one guy in the back. So Eric Niebler wrote a very interesting um, uh, library for C++ in which he used templates and generative programming and operator overloading to implement regular expressions in C++. And the way he defines them is, for example, the shift is like connect, you connect these two things together. And um, the pipe is like alternatives, like pipe in regex, okay? I, I, I very much encourage you to, to search for it. Uh, I think that init his initial library was called expressive. And you know, it's not expressive. I'm not kidding. So among the more, uh, the more interesting examples of expressive are like really trivial regular expressions that take like 10 lines in C++ because you use all of these operators in an unusual manner to simulate regular expressions. So the way expressive works is by hijacking the C++ operator syntax into doing what regular expressions want to do. And it's very ingenious, but it's not super integrated, it doesn't look like a regular expression anymore, right? So that would be this approach, right? Um, there's another example of, like for example, link in C-sharp. Who knows link with a Q? A few of us. 
So Link uh, actually has, you know, it's more integrated because it's, they changed the language to make it work nice. And it's a way of expressing queries, relational queries, in a way that's integrated with C Sharp. And, you know, that kind of works pretty well, but not, not perfect because it's not, the, the filter is not recognizable as a relational database query. And uh, to wit, there are actually a lot of simpler uh, DSLs, uh, domain-specific languages that you want to embed, such as you want to have formatted printing, or you want to have a uh, regular expression we've dis discussed already, or you want to describe grammars like in Lex and Yak in an embedded language within another language. And that kind of stuff, right? This is another form of a grammar. <clears throat> Not to mention SQL, which we discussed already. So if you want to integrate everything within the same language, you're going to have, it's going to look the same for, every, for all of these. No matter what you do, it's going to be like a crapola of overloaded operators and macros and stuff like that. I'm, so, I'm sure you saw that kind of code. Attempts to do these things with poor integration within the language. So I don't like this. Here, here's what I'm, we're going to do here. <clears throat> we're going to use with native grammar, native meaning SQL, EBNF, what have you. We're going to process that during compilation, and we're going to generate decode at the end. So you take a string that looks like an SQL statement. You compile it using compile time D features, and you generate decode, which you compile within the same session. And that's uh, the approach I'm going to discuss here. Let's start with uh, a simple example here. Getting back to the awesome factorial. Uh, but there's a different point I want to make, not the implementation, which is trivial. Uh, we have this factorial function. It, it, has, it does stuff. It has a decrement, has a local variable, it has a loop. It has you know, non-trivial things in it. And uh, in the first line here, F1, you compiled factory of 10. And you say auto, or you say like U long, factory of 10, and you compute it. That's fine. It's going to occur during runtime. But here's an interesting thing. If you put static instead of auto, if you use static, if you force a static context to the expression, the compiler is going to force, it evaluation, force its evaluation during compile time the second factorial call will be interpreted. OK? Who knows about C++ const expr? OK. Well, here's, here's, what, here's my trouble with const expr. And it's very funny because there's agreement on this. I'm not the only guy yelling at people about this, right? So I'm very happy to be in good company. My problem with const expert is that actually you want to use const expert everywhere in a program. You, put, you want to put it anywhere. So the first time I looked at it, I said, this is stupid. It's gotta, this must be like the default. Oddly enough, a year later, effective modern C++ book by Scott Myers came out, and guess what was one of the items? Use context for wherever possible. Awesome. So the problem with context is that it, it forces on the, at the definition point, it forces you to think about, well, should I evaluate this during compilation or runtime? And uh, most of the time, you do want to give yourself that option. Indeed, it's completely different. Everything is context per. And you decide at the call site. You don't decide when you define factorial whether it's going to be uh, um, computed during compilation or runtime, but you decide at the call site. And at the call site, you say, I'm going to create a variable and I'm going to call factorial. Fine, runtime. I'm going to define a static, a constant value, then it's going to be initialized during compilation. But what's the difference? What's the difference? Because uh, so this is the same factorial call with the same uh, compiler time defined parameter, so it's just a value on the right side of the equality operator. Right. So what's the difference between these two guys? Um, I'll tell you exactly what. 
The difference is this is going to run a few hundreds of times slower, the compile time, because it's going to be interpreted. The first one is going to run during runtime. It's going to use like heavily optimized assembler to run, and it's going to be real fast. But it's going to be a runtime. But this guy is going to be, well, let me interpret the factorial function, and the interpreter is going to do it on the AST of the program, and it's going to be slower. And that's, that's one of the differences. So it's the main difference. I understand this difference, but why is, is depended by uh, type qualifier? Or? Why is it defined by? The, because I think that's the better way. That's the short answer. I, I think you want to decide. I, I don't think the compiler should take initiative here. I don't think it's the compiler. That's in C++. In C++, the compiler can look at the factorial calls and can say, you know what? The hell with you. I'm going to do this during compilation. A second. In D, you got to ask for it. You're going to say, this is runtime, this is com compile time. Yes? Another explanation would be to invoke the single responsibility principle and tell that it's not the, not the role of this function to impose on the color how it should be used. It should be focused only on factorial. And so I agree that it's better. Right. So, so there's the explanation that the, the single responsibility principle which is awesome because it's from Robert Munn's book, which I love. And past that, you had me. I was like, sure, I'm with you. So this RP says it shouldn't be the function that decides. It should be the caller. Yes? So the other thing is that the C++ compiler have to, uh, have to check if the context per function is really context per. Right. And even if you don't use this context per somewhere, you pay for the price for it. Yeah, so you know the, the point was uh, the compiler must uh, figure out whether that's uh, early, whether the function is uh, can be evaluated during compilation, and that's a, a bit of extra cost. Uh, I would say let's not bash C++ too much right now. Um, I understand I got you in the mood here, but um, <laughs> but I do argue that it's better to make this decision at at the call site. Yes. What's the default if I get a U log F3? Is it going to be auto or static? If you if you uh, if you say auto, it's going to be non-static. It's going to be runtime computed. What if I get an int f3 and call it factorial? So it's going to evaluate it runtime. Or? It's automatic runtime. So default is runtime, and it's interesting because most of the time you want to um, you want to make the decision yourself, and I'll explain why in, in a second here, which is actually very interesting. Why why you want to make sure that that's compiled and that's runtime? It's not discretionary. Yes. Just an idea, why should static F2 be 50 times slower when we have just compiled heavily optimized versions of factorial uh, for the runtime? Why won't we use the already compiled version for uh, interpreted code? That's great. That's awesome. So you want to JIT. You want to JIT the already, the already compiled factorial function, right? Uh, yes. Um, why, not use F1? why not use F1? Well, F1 is dynamic, so you can't just use it. Yeah, but we just, we just calculate F1. So you didn't cal no, you, pro you generated code for computing it. So, but his point is valid. You could JIT. Yes, you could JIT. Actually, if, you, if it's a function in a library and it's already in object file format, you could just JIT that thing because it's in, a, in a machine code already. Yes, please join me and contribute that, that jitting, because it's been spoken about, but it's not done yet. What about impure functions? <laughs> what about impure functions? Impure, sorry, well, there's a joke which I always like give priority to. Yes? I just said that please stop interpret and let you talk. <laughs> oh, let me, no, no, I, I love this. I love this, because I learn. I, I get to learn. What's, I'm, I have a microphone, so if anybody kind of gets on my nerves, I can say, Let's continue. <laughs> Louder, and th nobody can. There's a um, point here. Impure, impure, you can't. Uh, those impure functions are going to issue compile time error messages if you try to call them during compilation. And separate compilation, dynamic linking. Separate compilation, you can't call functions that you don't have the body for. Uh, but in D, it's, you've, most often you have the bodies. <laughs> you have the bodies. Okay, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> it, it's not. Politically correct. With one version of the library, some of the functions get compiled into the program in night, and then you change the library. So this is Here's what I say. Let's move on. 
That's, right? There's that great suggestion there a minute ago. OK, so I can take a, a bunch of questions offline after, after my talk and this evening. So um, I'm glad there is interest in this. Anyhow, so this has been like a huge thing for D. And we, we, um, we've, we reap a lot of benefits from, from this approach. It's like essentially any function is a candidate for a compile time evaluation. And unless it does I.O., it's pure call system. You can't call like, you know, on link to remove files during compilation. You don't want to allow that. <laughs> Right? So you, you can't execute system code and that kind of stuff. But, so there's limitations, but essentially any function in D is a candidate for compile time evaluation, which is great. <clears throat> um, well, let me uh, kind of throw another thing, which is, looks completely unrelated. And again, we're going to get to the red telephone story style, which is like there's this uh, completely unrelated thing that you can do in D, which is called mixin. And if you pass a string to mixin, it's going to put in it's going to compile it. Of course, it's got to be a constant string. It can't be a string that you read from the keyboard. It's got to be constant, because that would mean you have an online compiler there. That's possible, but it's not what we do here. Mixing means, give me a string, I'll put it in code. And this is like really stupid. Like the first exam is like completely like brain dead, because what it does is like, why the hell didn't you just write right line, hello world? Why did you put a mix in and escapes around it and stuff, and it's crazy. But a second example should make you think, should make you doubt, should, should make you go like, well, hold, wait a second, there's... What about security, like we've got uh, in JavaScript and... What about security? Yeah, and whenever you write about JavaScript in Google, you, you get like 100 pages, don't use it. Wow. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of security issues caused by this approach. But you have uh, to support compiler stuff in runtime? You don't have to support compilation during runtime. That would be if you, read, uh, if you read the string from the console and compiled it. This is like as simple as essentially like passing the string through the regular parsing and compilation process. Okay? It's not very sophisticated. It's an easy feature to implement. So you have like mixin and you pass it a string, but the interesting thing is you can pass to mixin a function call that you make during compilation, as we just talked like a slide ago. Where were you? Yes. But the function must, it doesn't have to be nominally pure. It doesn't have to have the pure keyword there. It must be as good as pure, kind of evalu can be evaluated during com compilation. So this is, there's something here, folks. <clears throat> we're getting somewhere here. Because we have this thing, which is simple and interesting. We have this thing here, which is simple and interesting. And they, they make for a sum that's huge, much greater than the parts. Yes? We will end with the Lisp. <laughs> you, you can say Lisp macros and that kind of stuff. But let, let me get to my point here. <clears throat> so. You have, you have a way to compile, to evaluate during compilation any decode within limits. Second, and including strings, by the way. So you can compute, you can do string processing during compilation. You can generate strings and return strings from functions. Number two, you can take a string and compile it during compilation. <laughs> I, yes? You can have those string literals to serve as a basic building block, for example, the tokens and keywords for the uh, DSL, which you want to write. Then you will write the code that will transform, parse it, and it will run in <laughs> Amazing. You just, if I, you stole my thunder because I need to repeat what you said instead of saying what I wanted. He said you can actually take a string that's like a different language, like SQL or regular expressions or what have you. And then you can pass it, you know, you can pass it through this mixin thing and you get decode that's specialized for that particular SQL statement or that particular regular expression or whatnot. Give me a second, I, I do need to kind of move, uh, move forward here. So wait a minute, we have two things here that combine naturally and powerfully. So all of a sudden there's this explosion of things that you can do because you can have functions that generate strings of decode from whatever input you want. 
And that includes, I'm gonna get to regular expressions soon, but let me start simple. There's a feature in the standard library which is called bit fields. D doesn't have bit fields because it does them in the library. Bit fields, you say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have an uh, unsigned integer here, I'm gonna give it the name x, and I'm gonna to give it two bits, and I'm gonna have an int called y, three bits, and so on. And bit fields passed through mixing is going to generate decode that does all the masking and rotating, all of those good things that you need to do with bit fields. And you wrote a line of code, and you have all of the nitty gritty of bit fields taken care of. And if you actually put right line around it, if you call bit fields and put right line, you're gonna see the decode that's generated. And it's not trivial. So this would be a simple example, but there's, there's much better examples. Consider a grammar, and this is actually a code written by uh, Philippe Sigo. So he took a grammar in this format, which is called PEG, Porte Expression Grammar. <clears throat> And here, you can write a small calculator that way. And you describe grammar in its own language, and you have, as you said, you have, oh, it's a string literal. Look at this, nothing on my sleeves, really simple. I have a string literal, and you call this function grammar, which is going to generate decode specialized for parsing that particular grammar, like Lex and Yak. And then you mix it in, and you get the parser. But wait, there's more. You can use the parser. So this gets really meta. So at this point, I advise you either like, this is going to be weird, OK? <clears throat> because you can use the parser to parse things during compilation or at runtime, as you wish. I myself don't understand the implications of, of this, right? So, but I'm counting on you. <laughs> That's why I like interruptions, because you guys kind of can, whenever I have a, like a brain fart, you like, uh, there's a comment that's great, and I'm like, okay, I don't have to say anything here. So you can use this expression. Uh, okay. The first parse three one is uh, parsing that occurs during compilation. And uh, pragma is like a, a meet a message during compilation about what the tree looks like. And this is a parsing at runtime, because you read the line from the console and you read it, you, you parse it. So you have a parser generator within the same compilation, the same session. Same, there's no separate steps like with Lex and Yak. And during the same session, you get to take the grammar in its native format, like a grammar, generate decode for it, use that decode still during compilation, and or use that decode to parse during runtime, okay, which is completely nuts. OK, but what the hell? But how you will debug it? How will you debug it? This pragma is like your first tool for debugging this kind of code. Pragma is going to print you, uh, for example, it's going to print you the generated code. I'm going to tell you, it's still not a perfect story. So it's, it's equ equivalent to printf debugging, right? So it's not perfect. But um, there's always ways to improve it. Anyhow, the concept is powerful enough for us to, um, to use this and promote it over, uh, over other approaches. It's pretty awesome. All right, and uh, to show that this actually does scale is uh, you can, actually a guy that did this. So you can generate the D language grammar itself. It's 1,000 lines of grammar uh, in, the EB, in the PEG format, and it generates 3,000 lines of a, a good performance D parser. So that's, that would be uh, the highly integrated Lexinac. But let me give you like the last example here, and I, I, I swear I'm leaving. <clears throat> Regular expressions. It's a very classic DSL that, you know, maybe you're not using a grammar in every one of your programs, but a regex, maybe somewhat to, to your own sadness, you kind of use sometimes, right? Let's fess up. Use regex, regular expressions. All right, as many hands, as many problems, right? Regular expressions are an interesting tool that can be easily abused, but it uh, has a, a many, many uh, great uses. So it turns out that in the D standard library, um, graduate students by the name of Dmitry Olshansky, he had a great idea. He said, let me uh, do a regular expression engine that's going to generate with the CT regex here, bang. Bang means I'm going to instantiate a template with a specific argument. 
it's, uh, you know, bang is like unlike, it's not like square brackets. Uh, it's not like angle brackets. We use the bang as a binary operator. So you generate, during compilation, a regular expression specialized for this particular, an engine specialized for this particular regular expression, not any. It's not generic regular expression engine. It's, it's an engine that's specialized for this. And the way this works is it parses this string, it extracts the automaton from it, and it generates decode for the automaton. So if you print this guy, it's going to yield like a, a large chunk of decode that's an automaton with switch and four and stuff inside of it. And you also have sharing much of the engine because of that const expert discussion we had, sharing much of the engine, you have a runtime regex that is generic and works for any regular expression, including variables. So you have two mechanisms of doing. Either you have a generic regular expression engine, or you have this specialized automaton generator. Which do you think is faster? Compilation or runtime? Ah, compilation or runtime. Well, I like to think of compilation time as free, within limits, like, right? Oh, sorry. Oh, I, I won't show my hand. So yeah, compilation time is going to be slower for the second, obviously, right? How about runtime? What? Yes, oh, yes. First, who's for first is faster? Generic engine, who's for second is faster? OK, you got it right. The second one is going to be faster because it's specialized and it uses code that's very well tuned for recognizing exactly one regular expression, not any regular expression. OK? Well, by how much faster? That is the question. Well, here's the answer. Well, if you want fast regular expressions, maybe you don't want to use this. That's not where you want to go to. It's not the fastest. <clears throat> This is Eric Nibla's expressive library, which we discussed. This is the, Fred is the, the, the name that uh, Dimitri gave to this uh, DRegex library. And this is the runtime version, Fred. OK? And it's decent, because it's followed by RE2, which is a highly optimized C library for regular expressions. Do you know about RE2? Probably you're using it. It's, it's very frequent, so it's, it's all, all over, right? Who knows what V8? OK, quite a few of you. V8 is Google's JavaScript library um, engine. And it uses for regular expressions jitting. It generates machine code specialized for the regular expression. It does the same thing that I just said. So that's why V8 is the fastest in the world. V8 is the fastest regular expression engine in the world. It uses jitting, and it's screaming fast. But it's not faster than, the, than Dimitri's compile time regular expression engine, which is now in the, standard, in the D standard library. This engine, written in D that generates D and then mixes it in, is faster than the fastest in the world. <laughs> that was my dramatic ending. You weren't supposed to laugh here. You didn't, you didn't laugh at the right times. Poland, what, what are you doing? Thanks very much. Thank you.